Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Okay, Father in heaven, we're very thankful uh, for the class that we have. I'm thankful for everyone that's here. I pray, Lord, that you'll uh, help us tonight as we uh, try to become a, a Jesus-built church and, Lord, building Jesus-built lives. Uh, bless us now, I pray, O oh Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. So we've, we've already covered the Great Confession. The Jesus-built church model was of the Great Confession. That you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In fact, we looked at the first week three important features about who He is. Uh, as, the, as the Son of God. Who He is, what He did, and what Jesus has. We focused on those three things. Those are important things, and we're going to repeat some of that tonight as we go along. Uh, we looked last time at love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself and as being the great commandment. And the Jesus built church models on the great confession, the great commandment. And last time we focused on the whole idea to love the Lord your God. Okay, You love him through worship. And uh, we become believer priests the moment we accept Christ as our Savior. And we have priestly service to do. We focused on that. And also the love, love your neighbors, also our priestly service, and we focused last time completely on that. So as a Jesus-built church, we want to be making the great confession, confessing who Jesus is. We want to also live out the great commandment, okay, loving the Lord. We do that through worship, at great worship today. And then loving your neighbor as yourself. The third aspect is the great commission. And it says that Jesus, you know, said, all authority is given to me under heaven. And then he says, with all authority, he can do anything he wanted on heaven or earth, on earth. And what's he say? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He gave the great commission. And, and that's, <clears throat> that is the commission to the church. Because we see in the book of Acts, we've already looked at that in the book of Acts, they began to fulfill that. In fact, we're going to talk about that because in the book of Acts, Jesus has been on the earth for 40 days. He's about to go into heaven. And he's going to ascend from Mount of Olives into heaven. And uh, <clears throat> before he does, he gives a recommission of the Great Commission. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, the, the very end of the earth. Uh, witness, I kind of picked this up. Expert witness. I thought it was a, a, a dictionary art clip thing. And uh, specialized, I like this, opinion. We're going to talk about opinions tonight. This is really important. Okay? And so uh, it, it had everything I needed you know, right, right on that one page. But I want to talk about this. The, the Great Commission, as it's re-expressed G, by Jesus, just before he ascends, it, ascends into heaven, and he tells the disciples, you will be my witnesses, okay? And, and uh, this is a threefold witness. First of all, he said, you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem. So I put a star where Jerusalem is. Everybody see that on their map? You can write Jerusalem there if you want. But we're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem. Then he says, in all of Judea and Samaria. So Judea was a region down in this area. Samaria is up in this area. And, and actually, sandwich in between, Judea. And I could have made my circle a little larger. But he's saying, first of all, you're going to be a witness in the town where you're at. Second, you'll be a witness in the region where you are at. And then the third part, you will be my witness to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. Our church needs to have an impact in our neighborhood Waterford. All right? We need to have that impact with the gospel. Then we also have to get outside of our Waterford, okay? And we got to get to Oakland County, southeastern Michigan. We, we've got to get to Michigan, and at some point we got to expand to the ends of the earth. Now, I notice in the passage it's not either or. It's both and. That's why I'm so excited. All right, in about a month, we're all invited to attend the commissioning service of the goods going to Hungary that we support as a church, as our international missionaries, okay? And they're going to Hungary. That's really us going to Hungary. We're sending them because as the church, and we'll see this the next time we do our uh, Jesus Built Life series, okay, in February, we'll see, we'll survey the book of Acts and see that's exactly what they did. They started in Jerusalem, 
Judea and Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. <clears throat> We're going to focus on the missionary journeys of Paul at that time. But th this is what God wants. He wants me, he wants you to be the witness. Not just Jesus is the witness, because Jesus was. He was a witness. He was the Word of God, okay? So he was a witness. But he now passed that on. To his <coughs> he passes it on to you. You're to be a witness. So I want to talk about an approach to sharing your faith as a witness for Jesus Christ that I call celebrate your faith, all right? It's called celebrate your faith. Now, the definition of celebrate, I've got it on here, is to observe with festivities, right? Observe with festivities. Uh, do we have any... Can you think of any festivities that we celebrate? Christmas. Tell me one. Christmas. Easter. 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 Christmas. Easter. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> you got the idea. All right. So, yeah, celebrate with festivities. <clears throat> Another meaning was to make known publicly, like the newspaper celebrated the end of the war in red headlines. And so I, I, I made it up. This paper says war ends. It's in red headlines. It's celebrated. It, what it is, in that sense, it's saying it's communicating. That's why I want to call this approach to sharing your faith. Celebrating your faith. Because it's going to be wrapped around celebrations, but you're the one that's going to verbally celebrate it. You're going to tell it. You're going to tell, tell the story. And the third part of it is to praise widely. To praise widely. That's a celebration. I'm going to praise widely. So, all right. Now, there are three major Christian celebrations I can think of. And if you're on the page, you probably already have seen. Celebration number one? Christmas. Christmas. All right. I want you to, if you got a blank, you're filling it in. The second one is? Good Friday. Good Friday. All right. And the third one is? Easter. Easter Sunday. All right. Now, at Christmas, we celebrate what? Birth. 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 Is that written on the page already? Yes. No, it sure is. Oh, good class. I don't have it up here. All right. And Good Friday, we celebrate? Yeah. yeah. And on Easter? Resurrection. 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 Now, remember the first week we talked about making the great confession. We talked about who he is, what he did, and what he has. I want to share with you a way to share your faith where you talk about those who he is, Christmas. He is the God man. Remember we talked about that? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. The second thing is Good Friday. What did he do? Died for our sins. Died on the cross to take away our sins, right? Take away our sins. And Easter, what does he have? Resurrection. Eternal life. Resurrection life. Eternal life. Never to die again. Okay? And so I'm going to suggest a way to share your faith around those three holidays. Now this is really important. Because my goal is I'm, I'm hoping as we as a church will begin to focus on and attracting and drawing in younger generation. And uh, I have a friend who's uh, a pastor. He's just on a sabbatical. And uh, he's taken time out of his, for, of his summer to research millennials. And millennials don't accept the Bible as a starting point. Does that amaze you? You know, mostly I could say, hey, you know, in the Bible it says, and they would say, oh, who cares about the Bible? Okay. And it's become meaningless because they're growing up in a very secular society. But they are acquainted with Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter. And so I've been working on an approach where we talk about what they're familiar with already and then bring the Bible in on the next step. So that I'm still going to bring the Bible because the Bible is the power of God unto salvation. Okay? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, not my celebrations, but what those celebrations are about, they're all about the Bible. And so I'm gonna, I want to share an approach with you how to share your faith with the younger generation. That's my goal, is that we can reach the younger generation uh, for the Lord. All right? Now, the goal of the celebration of faith, okay, celebrate your faith, is that by your personal celebration, that is your public conversing about Jesus, that people will confess Jesus as Savior and Lord, just as Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, so faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. That's the New Living Translation. Faith comes through hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. People don't get saved by my good deeds. No one has ever gotten saved by, being, by doing a good deed. 
that just opens a doorway so that you can share the good news. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the good, the good news of Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> all the good deeds that I do, all right, if I don't communicate the good news of Jesus, they're just good deeds. That's why the Bible talks about giving a cup of water in the name of Jesus, which is saying that when I do my good deed, I'm supposed to be doing that in the name of Jesus. The goal of any good deed is that that person will say, wow, why did you do that? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you about what he did for me. And so the goal of good deeds is actually to get an audience so that we can share the message because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the good news about Christ. Now, what I want to share with you today is an opinion-based approach to sharing your faith. Now, celebrate your faith approach is based upon asking opinion questions. This is really important. Because in an opinion question, there are no wrong answers. If I ask you your opinion of the Lions' performance in the football game today, <laughs> all right, and you can say just about anything, and I could be totally in disagreement with it, but your answer wouldn't be wrong because it would be your opinion. And then my answer wouldn't be wrong because it would be my opinion. And so the approach that I'm using here, it, I take it right from Jesus. Jesus said, okay, he said to the disciples were together, and he said, who do men say that I am? And then they said, oh, you're Elijah. You know, they named a few prophets, one of the great prophets, Jeremiah. Said, and who do you say that I am? He's asking for their opinion. You know, and then he answers correctly, and because he answers correctly that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says, hey, listen, my Father revealed that to you. God was at work. Anybody that confesses, it's only because God was at work in them. Right? So, there are no wrong answers to an opinion question. If, the answer, if they're answering you honestly, that just represents their opinion. Even if the answer to the question is blatantly false, if it represents their opinion of that person, then they have answered correctly the opinion question. This makes this, this approach of sharing your faith natural and easy. It's very simple to share your faith. And it's very natural because we're always asking people for their opinion on things. Now, there are three opinion questions that I think we need to ask. And the first opinion question that I think that we need to ask is, who is Jesus? Jesus. So in your opinion, who is Jesus? Now, I've, I've analyzed this, and there's basically three responses. The right answer. The person might say, well, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the right answer, right? And now, there's some that are just a good answer. Oh, Jesus is a great prophet. Well, was he a great prophet? The greatest, okay? Yeah, so that, that's a good answer. Then there are some who will give you the wrong answer. They might say, oh, he's just a myth mythological figure that people invented so that they could have religious worship. Okay, they might throw something off the cup there. So basically, there's one fourth one on there I didn't put on, you can jot that down, it's called, I don't know. <laughs> you all right? I don't know. All right, it doesn't matter if they give you that I don't know. Uh, every time I ask this question, I, I, I'll preface it, hey, may, may I ask you a, an opinion question? Or can I get your opinion on some spiritual things? The person says, sure, go ahead. And I'll say, well, in your opinion, who is Jesus? They're going to give me one of these three, possibly that fourth, I don't know. And if I treat that I don't know, I, I'm, going to treat, I'm going to treat every answer the same. Because my response to the question of their opinion, what would they think of Jesus? If they answer the right, right way, I say, well, of course. You know, they say that Jesus is the Christ of the living God. I say, of course. That's what Christmas is all about. What am I doing? I am appealing to the starting point of a millennial who accepts Christmas, but maybe doesn't accept what the Bible says. Usually because they don't know what the Bible says. Okay, And so I'm starting with a point of contact where I know that they've got some connection. All right? And so I will say to that person, even if they answer correctly, of course, that's what Christmas is all about. Right, let me go to what, the next one. Somebody gives me a, a, a good, an answer like, Jesus was a great prophet, he was a great preacher, uh, Jesus was a miracle worker, uh, Jesus, whatever they give me as their opinion of who Jesus is, and, and it's close. I say, yes, oh, that's so cool. But he was so much more. You see, that's what Christmas is all about. See what I've done? 
no matter what they respond to this, I'm going to say, that's what Christmas is all about. <laughs> even, even if they say, oh, he's a mythological uh, figure or he's a, uh, he is the uh, uh, hallucination of a bunch of people that were on drugs. You know, you get some real wild stuff out there. People usually trying to just smoke screen you. But and then I'll say, well, you know, some people might think that. You do. Um, <laughs> I won't put that part in there. But some people might think that. But you know, Christmas is about, what am I doing? No matter how they answer this, what if they say, I don't know? I'll say, oh, that's too bad because you know, Christmas is all about, and that's my starting point. We'll start with Christmas. And so from here, I've asked the question, I've gotten the response, and I've given a quick response to their response. And from there, I say, because Christmas is all about <clears throat> Jesus, who is God, and became man. Isn't that what our first lesson was about? Yeah. Yeah. I'm now sharing. I'm, I'm celebrating the gospel. I'm telling the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And, and then I can say, you know, even in the Bible, it says in the very beginning of the Bible, it calls Jesus the Word before he became flesh. And it says, and the Word became flesh. And I, I just, I, I'm telling the gospel. That's what Christmas is about. God came down from heaven and became one of us. And, and then I, I, and the Word became flesh. And that's why I put it here, review week one. You, you, you can elaborate on this, okay? In a few moments, we're going we're gonna to actually do that a little bit. So then my second question, after they responded to the question, my, my first question, and, and uh, I've interacted with that, I said, well, I'd like to follow that up with another question. What is the greatest thing that you believe Jesus ever did? Now I'm talking about what he did. Who he is, what he did. I'm talking about, this is theology, because remember the first week I said this was all systematic theology? I boiled it all down, okay, as much as I can to kernel of the gospel. What is the greatest thing he ever did? Well, there's only three answers here, possibly the fourth one. I don't know, okay? <laughs> the, the right answer that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Uh, the good answer, well, he walked down water, fed 5,000, whatever, you know, they think is the greatest thing he ever did. The last one here is a wrong answer. He caused all the religious hatred in the world. <laughs> uh, that is way off. That's wrong, right? <laughs> that's way out there. But you, that's a possibility. You could get something like that. Believe it or not, I'm going to answer each one of these the same way. I'm going to say, okay, first one, Christ died on the cross where he says, well, of course, that's what Good Friday is all about. See how that works? All right. If they say, well, is some of these miracles or something else that he did? I'm going to say, yes. And so much more. For example, on Good Friday, and I'm going to talk about Good Friday. All right. Does this make sense? All right. And then the, the third one, this person says, oh, that's where all the hatred comes from. I said, well, some people might think, of, think that. But when you think about Good Friday is about, and I'm going to go to Good Friday. No matter how they answer this, okay? No matter what they say. Even if they say, I don't know. I'll say, well, that's too bad because, you know, Good Friday is all about what Jesus did, the greatest thing he ever did. And what am I going to talk about? Well, that's only On Good Friday, he died on the cross, what? As the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And I'll talk a little bit about the Lamb of God. And then I'll say, I usually go to John 3.16 because that's the verse I got saved on. I always weave that in any conversation. I tell how I got saved. And I'll say, you know, this is what John 3.16 is all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I got the verse before, the verse after. I could put 18 in there because I use all of them most of the time. And that it's very simple. He died for us from Romans 5 8. He died for us. For us. He took my place. This is the greatest thing he ever did is he took my place on the cross and he paid my price. And, and so that that's what he did. He's the Lamb of God that took away my sin because I was part of the world. Is this making sense? All right, it's a very simple approach. And then the third one is, what, what is it, in your opinion, what is it that Jesus has that attracts so many people to him? See, now I'm leveraging the fact that there's a lot of Christians in the world. And what is it that Jesus has? What is it about, what does he have that draws so many people to him and you haven't been drawn yet? See, I, I, I'm kind of messing with them. You're pulling them in. And, and I'm going to, same thing, I'm going to have a right answer well, he has salvation. He's got forgiveness. Uh, he gives me peace. Okay, he have a good answer. Well, what does he have? He has power, man. He's got, you know, miraculous power. Or what? A bad answer. He has hypnotic power. <laughs> he's hypnotized masses of people. They read the Bible and they're all hypnotized. 
okay? And so no matter what they respond at this point, I'm going to respond to that by saying, well, of course, but the first one, the right answer, salvation, forgiveness, peace. Well, of course, that's what Easter is all about. And I'm gonna talk about Easter. That was a good, the good answer, he's got miraculous powers. Yes, he does. And he has so much more. For example, on Easter, he arose from the dead. Okay, see, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get the gospel, I'm gonna get the gospel. Even the wrong answer, the guy, well, some people think so. Like I said before, at least one, you're the guy that thinks this. <laughs> I don't say that part, but I said, some people think so. But Easter is about, and I'm going to talk about Easter, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Easter is about resurrection life. It's about resurrection life. <laughs> I, I haven't put this down as your verse to memorize yet, but you need to memorize this. This is a great verse. For he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. Let's talk about resurrection. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then I'd like to question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Because that's really where I want to go. Uh, sometimes I'll just use Romans 6.23 like I talked last time. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want to illustrate it. I'll put that $5 bill in the Bible, close it up. How do you get the $5 bill? Well, you got to take the Bible to get the $5 bill. And in order to get eternal life, it's in the resurrected Lord. You have to have Him. Okay, and, and so that's that's what I'm gonna do in Europe, and, and I'm gonna go through the resurrection life. No, at this point, I want to ask for a, a decision, and so where my last verse left off, I'll, I'll hang off of this and I'll say, hey, when Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and the life," he finally asked, "Do you believe this?" Let me ask, "Do you believe this?" And if the person says yes, they believe him, then I'm gonna say, "Well, will you confess him now to be the Son of God who died for your sins?" I go back to the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what Peter confessed. Will you receive him as your Savior and Lord? And then I got additional verses here. For as many as receive him, to them he gave the, the authority to become the children of God. And, and these are from a different approach I use. I threw them in because I, I use those verses all the time. But you don't have to use all those verses. Now, I, I want to pause for a moment. This is a lot to digest, is it? Three major questions. Three opinion questions. Number one has to do with who he is. Second question has to do with what he did. Third one has to do with what he has. And so and so when I ask the opinion question, okay, in your opinion, who is he? No matter what answer they're going to give me back, I'm going to say, well, Christmas is all about the fact that the Word became flesh. Right? And I'm going to dwell it. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. That This is the God-man. It's about God becoming man. The second opinion question, whenever I ask that, in your opinion, okay, what does he have? You know, what is the greatest thing that, that he had? That he did. That he did. I'm sorry. I'm jumping to the third question. What is the greatest thing he ever did? And I'm going to say, he died on the cross because behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. It goes right back to my, my verse, see? And then the third one, what is it that he has that draws so many people to him? And no matter what they say, it's all about Easter. He arose from the dead, and he has eternal life to give to all who believe in him. And I can use John 3, 16. I can use the resurrection and life. I can use any verse like that, okay? And, and so that's, that's it. Then I'm going to ask. I like that one in you know, our, the resurrection and life because it says, do you believe this? Jesus asked the question, do you believe this? And if the answer, she did, if you go into context, you'll see that uh, it was Mary and Martha. I can't remember which one right now. Uh, but said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So she did. She believed it, all right? So... <clears throat> I would pray with the person. After I've asked them, will you do that? And the person says, yeah, I will do that. I will pray with them because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I will lead them through a very simple prayer. It goes like this. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. What is that? Who he is. Right? All I'm doing is reinforcing who he is. The second part I'll do is, <clears throat> who died on the cross for my sins. That's what he did. And I now accept the free gift of eternal life that is what he has. Real, real simple. I'm, I'm, I'm just reinforcing these three thoughts all the way through as I share my faith with people. I'm just reinforcing these three thoughts. Is this making sense? All right. I've used a lot more complicated approaches, but I am convinced the simpler you can make the gospel, the better.
people give up on complexity, especially in my generation. Pardon? People give up on complexity, especially in my generation. Yeah, that's true. The Romans Road is a little complex. <laughs> I, and I use the Roman Road, that's my favorite. I use it. Before that, I used the evangelism explosion approach. Talk about complex. <laughs> there was a 13 week intense yeah, study. So dumb, dumb. The Bible says all you have to have is childlike faith. Now, all that complexity, I never use that on a child. Right? But I think I can use this approach on a child. <laughs> And they'll get it, and they'll understand, and believe. And, and so that's why uh, I, I like this approach. Now, I want to tell you about some real stories, okay? Because consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. So I want to tell you about the very first time I shared my faith. i got to tell you a little bit of backup why I decided to share my faith. Uh, I was a member at the Brain Baptist Church in Detroit, and our youth group was exploding with growth. We were getting kids like crazy coming. So we decided we'd have a visitation program on the kids that were absent. So a handful of us would go out and visit on the kids who were absent. And one of my friends, Bill Gaynor, he had gone to the Denver Baptist High School, and he knew how to share his faith. He never taught me. And so we're, we're visiting, and then all of a sudden I see he's got a Bible, man. And he's going through the Bible, going through the Romans Road. And, and he's, and he's uh, done. He asked this kid if he'd pray and accept Christ as a Savior. And he prayed and accepted Christ. It blew me away. We can do that? I thought we'd take him to church. I thought they had to do that. So I went and bought myself a New Testament. I usually carry one on me. I got a little New Testament about the size of these. And I, I got it out and I marked all the verses on Romans Road. I tried to remember the ones he did. I marked them all up. I went out hunting. <laughs> and I had it all figured out. I had figured out I'm going to pick up a hitchhiker. <laughs> I won't know this guy, right? So I'm driving by, I see a guy out with his thumb up. I got my line down, my opening line, because I don't waste any time. Here's my line. Hop in if you don't mind riding with a religious fanatic. <laughs> I pull up, door swing it out, and yell, hop in if you don't mind riding with a religious fanatic. And the guy jumps in, and I know him. <laughs> Backfired, oh man. So he said, oh, he said, so you're a religious fanatic. <laughs> because I, that, that just that was the monkey wrench. I couldn't do anything. <laughs> and so I said, oh yeah, I'm the, I'm, we're going, I've got a great youth group at church. I'm, now I'm just talking about church. Forget the Romans road, man. This is my own love. <laughs> so... So, <clears throat> what I do is I, I take him right to his house, drop him off. So the next day, I went to pick up my girlfriend, take her to work, and uh, I see him on that road hitchhiking again. So I swing by, say, "Hop in!" This time I didn't say anything about the religious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're talking about our youth group, okay? Because this is my group. We're talking back and forth about all exciting things at the youth group. And I drop her off, and I said, "Hey," I said, um, "Hey, Bill, where do you want to go?" And, and Bill said, "Well, I forgot what the destination was." And I said, "I said." I start sharing now, and I said, uh, Bill, um, are you a Christian? I mean, I banded Romans Road. I just went for it. Are you a Christian? He said to me, no, but I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is not, I mean, textbook. It never goes according to textbook. <laughs> no, I'm going to be. So I said, well, what do you mean, no, you're going to be? He said, I'm going to be soon as you tell me how. Oh. Oh. I pull over. I get my tech. I, I got it all marked up, man. I'm ready. I got all my Roman road verses, and I share with them. He prays right there in my car and accepts Jesus as Savior. He gets baptized. His brother comes to youth group. He gets saved, baptized. His sister comes to youth group, gets saved and baptized. Mom and dad come to church because they think, well, what is this? Maybe our kids are in a cult. <laughs> Mom and dad come to church. They get saved. They get baptized. You see what's going on here? You know, and the minister, the, and the pastor of the church didn't have a thing to do with any of this. Right? I can't be the only one sharing my faith in the church if we expect our church to grow. There's got to be all of us. That was my story with Bill Crane. That was, that's where I got my feet wet. Oh, my goodness. I told you about Russell Slate. He's my, my friend, that, and he calls me every now and then. In fact, I don't give him a phone call. That he came to men's prayer breakfast, and afterward I shared my faith with him, and he was the one who was sitting there. And as soon as he got done praying, he jumped up and down. I mean, he's just, he, my sins are forgiven. And the guy is as enthusiastic today as he was back then. He's told me, you know, and he said, you know, I keep track. He does. He's a real detailed person. 
He said, I kept track. He said, there's been over 300 people throughout my ministry, through the nursing home, different places, that have prayed and either recommitted their life to Christ or accepted Jesus as Savior for the first time. Isn't that amazing? In a nursing home, no less. In a nursing home. Yes, yeah, a huge nursing home ministry. It's, he's been doing it for over 25 years to the same nursing home. He goes every Sunday afternoon, and he rounds up every everybody in the house. He goes to every single room. He knows every one of them by name, and he hauls them down to the, the area, and then he preaches a message to them, and then when he's all done, he hauls them all back to their groups. He does it every week. He's been doing it for 25 years. Does that excite you? He has help, I'm assuming. Hmm? I said he has help, I'm assuming. Most of the time he does. Every now and then there'll be somebody to play the piano for him, that kind of thing. He's, he's very passionate about it. I have to say this, the church that I pastored in Ohio where we accepted Christ, they've taken him on staff as an evangelism pastor now. And he's never had theology training other than his own Bible study and sharing with people. His own sharing with people. Uh, i got to tell you about my neighbor Danny. <clears throat> in a few moments I've got to... I'm going to do some role play here. I've already picked a target. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a little role play. And I had a night where we were doing how to share our faith at church, kind of like we're doing tonight. <clears throat> and so I sat down, I did role play and everything. And, and I, when I go home, I'm, I'm exhausted, day's over. <clears throat> Knock on my door, and I go to the door, and here's my neighbor across the street. His name's Danny, young guy, high school kid. He's been coming because of our youth group at church. And he plays on the football team. You know, he's like the star. And I said, hey, Danny, what's up? What can I do? Can I help you with something? He said, yeah, I want to be saved. <laughs> so, I mean, what do I do? I come on in. I go right through the... What I just role-played at church now is reality. This kid is accepting Jesus as Savior. He later gets baptized, joins the church. So this is how church grows. This is how church grows. We've got to reach younger people and reach them for Christ. And I, I think I told you about my, my friend Dave Gassman. I taught an evangelism approach over in Muskegon when I was there. And nearly half the church had been trained in it. And we met for like three or four weeks every every quarter. And you had to train somebody. You were accountable to a partner. It's a different way than I'm teaching you tonight. And um, <clears throat> Dave Gassman uh, was, um, he was working with the uh, Muskegon Rescue Mission, playing a guitar. No, playing a harmonica. He plays harmonica. And so he's playing a harmonica in a, this small band group there. And uh, one night, the minister that was supposed to do the preaching didn't show up. And so Dave said, well, I'll preach. He did. The evangelist that I taught, he just went through the whole outline. It was a little different outline, but in, in our case, it would have been, he got up and said, hey, I want to tell you about who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what Jesus had. And he preached this message. A few people got saved. He preaches regularly there now. Isn't that amazing? Okay. And, 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 I don't know if I got any more. Okay. That's enough of those. Uh, uh, does this way work? Brian, does this work? Sharing faith like this? Putting them on the spot. Because this is exactly what I shared with you in my car. Isn't it? You remember? Did you pray? Every day. But you prayed and accepted Christ? Yes. He did. In my car. Okay. And, and I shared the approach I just sh showed you. And I'd like to, I wish everybody accepted when I, I, I've shared it with two others since I've been working on this. It's not my normal approach. I'm trying this because I want something that will reach young people. And starting with the Bible first is not a link to it. But if I come around the back door, I think that they'll give me an audience and I'll be able to share my faith. And it hits the basics of what you really need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God that he died on the cross and took away our sins, and that he's risen from the dead, okay? Uh, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, said, I preach to you how Jesus died for our sins, was buried, rose again. That's the gospel. <coughs> when a person believes in that, and they express their faith in God in that, they're saved, okay? I want to do a role play. So, <coughs> it's our time, all right? <laughs> so, I, I, I just met this guy, Bob. He's been hitchhiking. <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> so, and so, hey, can I ask you an opinion question? Sure, I'm full of opinions. <laughs> All right, you got this camera there? All right, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So, in your opinion, Bob, who, who, who is Jesus? Well, you know, I've, I've heard from Jesus. I have friends who uh, are Christians, 
you know, I, I'm just not so sure. I, I, have, I have a hard time believing that you know, he's, he was a real person. Just some of the things just seem so ridiculous. Yeah. Well, you're not, you're not the only person who thinks that way. But, but I want to tell you something about Christmas. You familiar with Christmas? Oh, sure. Yeah, well, see, Christmas, and we all celebrate. Everybody yeah. celebrates Christmas. Christmas is about that God became man. In fact, the Bible says this. In the beginning was the Word. And that's the title for Jesus before he became man. Okay. When he was God, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a little later in the, the Christmas passage out of the Bible, it says, and the Word became flesh. Christmas, okay, is about God becoming man. And then they named him Jesus. You see, Jesus is God come in the flesh. He's the Son of God. Okay, but why, would, why would he do that? Well, you know, I, I was going to ask you the question. I said, you want my opinion. Okay. <laughs> Jesus did something really important, and we celebrate that every Good Friday. You familiar with Good Friday? Yeah. All right. Yeah. You, you, on Good Friday, we're celebrating the fact that Jesus went to the cross, and he hung there, and he died on the cross. You know, and he hung there for hours. Yeah. And then we finally, he finally died. The Bible says what he was doing there is that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So there's something, a transaction going on there. It's the greatest thing that he ever did is he died on the cross and took away our sins. Now, sins are, you know, are the things when we mess up. And so he was like a sacrifice? He was a sacrifice, exactly. And he took our sins on himself to die on the cross. That's what it says. He took away the sin of the world. In John 3.16, this is a verse that really grabbed me when I was younger and, and why I became a Christian. is because it says, For God so loved the world... And the word world, the man that was sharing with me said, I could put my name in there. God so loved Dennis that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that if Dennis, it says whosoever, he said, if you're willing, then you put your name in there. And I did. That if Dennis believes in him, Dennis would not perish but have everlasting life. He said, because he took away the sins and I, I have to believe in him uh, to be my Savior. I want to ask you, uh, what do you think it is about Jesus that... Uh, so, well, what does he have that draws so many people to him? In your mind, what, what do you think? Well, I, I guess from well, from hearing about you know what what he did on Good Friday, and you know what what I know about you know my friends telling me what he you know, what he did according to the Bible, that you know, he did some pretty miraculous things. He, you know, I guess, he was. Uh, pretty miraculous person. Yeah, he, he did lots of miracles, and probably the greatest one of all, okay, is that he was raised from the dead. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. When, when he rose from the dead, he arose never to die again, and he has eternal life. In fact, one place in the Bible it says the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So that if he has it, that's what draws everybody to him. Because if you believe in him, that he has that life, okay? And you're willing to believe in him as the Son of God who came into the world, took your place on the cross, and has the gift of eternal life. If you're willing to do that, then you'll be saved. Does that make sense to you? Hmm. So it's, it's not just enough like to be a good person, to, you know, to, do, to, do, to do good things for other people, you know, to give to charities. And you know, a lot of people like that. think that that's, you know, that's the way to do it. Yeah, probably a lot of people have that opinion. But the Bible says in, in John 3, we're at point for God so loved the world. It says, he that has the Son has life, and he that does not have the Son has not life. Everything has to do with do you accept the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for your sins because only he could do it. He is God who's come to the world to take away our sins and he rose from the dead to prove that he's taken them away. Do you believe wow. this? That's a, that's, that's a whole lot. Alright, we're going to wrap it right there. You see how I'm doing that? And I'm just going to keep going back to those principles. I want to tell you about another guy while we're telling stories here. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Did he do a good job? It's always so hard in a class like this. And I've been doing this for years, years. 
Ever since I've been 17 years old, I've been doing this, trying to teach people how to share their faith. He that wins souls is wise. He's a, he that wins soul winners is wiser. No, that's, that's my proverb, proverb okay? <laughs> there was this guy that, um, a lady in the church was my barber. She, I'd go to her house, she, she'd cut my hair. And her husband claimed to be an atheist. So every time I would go, I would share the gospel. Every time that he was there, I would share. I talked to him a little bit. We talked about back then Cincinnati Bengals because we were Cincinnati Bengal fans down there. And you know, I tried to connect whatever I can to connect. We would talk, and and uh, I I started uh, I go over the gospel with him, and he said, "Oh man, I'm just not buying it." And I said, "That's okay." I said, "So I go get my haircut next time." I'd see him there and say, hey, I want to talk to you. And we talk. And I'd go over the same gospel all over again. <laughs> Man, he wouldn't buy it. Did so, you get it yet? Uh, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. Man, mm -hmm. I, I did this for months. I'd go and, you know, sometimes I'd just go visit him. Just And I'd go over the gospel, the same gospel. And I'd tell him the gospel story. And uh, he started coming to church. He'd come with his wife. You know, he started coming because I, and he knew every time he'd talk to me, I'm going to give him the gospel. Right? <laughs> and so uh, one Sunday... Uh, at, the, at the close of the, the sermon, I, and I don't give a message, uh, an invitation every Sunday, but at this one Sunday, I did. He, I said, I'm going to give it on the next song. If you would like to receive Christ, just come forward during the, the song. I didn't even get the words out of my mouth. He's coming down the aisle. And he said to me later, he said, I had already decided this morning if you give an invitation, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, and, and as I shared my faith with him, I learned that, you know, every, Every time I shared it, uh, it made him all the more interested because I believed it so much. So he started listening to Christian radio. And so he started listening to guys like Chuck Swindoll and uh, John what's, uh, Master, Mike MacArthur. Uh, and uh, he started listening to these guys, and, and pretty soon uh, he'd come to faith. I was down at the church um, for their 40th anniversary about two years ago. and. Uh, both Russell, the guy that so excited, he greeted me at the door, and, and so did this other fellow. He greeted me at the door, and uh, they're still going strong in their faith. All right, uh, and it only comes faith comes through hearing, hearing through the word of God. So what I've done, all right? Can I ask a question? I, got a question? How do you deal with like the Jehovah Witness that comes and knocks at your door? <laughs> Well, well, sell them a Baptist. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, it used to be Manual Baptist Church, but they were right. Yeah, because I, I, I'm a preacher and I probably know the Bible better than they do. Okay, I'll engage with them, but I don't encourage everybody to do that until you feel really confident in your faith. And uh, but the New World Translation that they use in the, in the you know the Jehovah's Witness, uh, they've retranslated uh, John chapter one in their Bible. Rather than saying in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, it says the Word was a God. Uh, so they have translated that that way. And they'll try to argue uh, from the Greek text about it because they've been told that. But, um, see, and I can challenge them on that because I read Greek and I know the grammar on that. And so uh, one day Jehovah's Witness did come to my door when I was down in Ohio pastoring, and I engaged them and everything. And a little later, my car wouldn't start, and my neighbor came over and said, was going to give me a jump, and he said, hey, I heard your sermon on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> sermon on the lawn. Sermon on the lawn. Yeah. So you never know who's listening when you share your faith. You never, you never, you never know. So, okay. It's good, and, and God wants that want. He places people to you if, if he wants you to talk to them. So I generally, if they come, I talk to them, and I tell them how happy I am and what my faith is, and uh, then one of them said, is it all right to come back and talk to you again? Oh, that's awesome. Sometimes. And I said, yes, I, Absolutely. I'd be glad to, but they, you know, the particular one didn't come, yeah. but I just, um, I just think, you know, their souls that God would like. Them. Yeah. We, how many here accepted the gospel the very first time you heard it? I didn't think so. <laughs> I how, how many? Not hearing it. Huh? Yeah, that's what I was just right. thinking. I, uh, I heard it all my life. Yeah. yeah so I grew up with it. So I grew up with it. Been a part of I grew up with it, but at eight years old, when I accepted Jesus, yeah. I made, I cemented that in my faith. I wrote it down, you know, and I still got the Bible. I wrote it in, you know, and I, I made that, made that firm. 
I think it's very rare that the first time a person hears it, they believe. And so somebody waters a plant, somebody else waters, we water, and it takes often multiple witnesses so that with, when, when I was sharing with the atheist, you know, he was getting it from John MacArthur too. He was getting it from, you know, these other sources. And so, and I just got to be faithful to do my part. Now, um, some people say, well, what if they say they don't believe? Okay, I, I don't believe. I said, of course you don't believe. If you did, you'd be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's a simple answer. Okay, and we'll talk about objections in a minute. Okay, we've done the role play. Now, it's your turn. In your books, I've given you a sample conversation. You see that? So you need to get groups of two or three, and uh, somebody's got a plan to be the, uh, the you, and the other person is the other person. So find a partner. Uh, if there's three of you, then somebody just observes. But find a partner. Who's going to read the you? Who's going to do the other? Now, the way this page works, okay? You pay attention for a second. The way the page works, you, you put the other person's name in there like I did. Bob, I'd like to get your opinion on a spiritual question if that's okay. He then becomes other and he says, sure, what's the question? Well, then I'm going to say, in your opinion, who is Jesus? Then he picks a column that he wants to go down, all right? And you're going to respond when it gets to the, he's going to say the other, and I'll be saying the you. And you just go down through this whole page and the back side. I want you to do this. Find a partner. Find partners. You can get groups of three even, and somebody just watches and kind of, uh, you know, you're the, 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 the mediating, officiating person over it. But let's take, let's take a few minutes to do this right now, okay? Yeah, you're going to find the same thing is true, that not everyone. Um, but when, when Peter responded correctly, Jesus said to him, uh, Blessed are you, uh, Peter, or, or Simon Barjonas. He said, uh, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And unless there's a divine work going on on the inside, nothing's happening on the outside. And there are times when I know when I'm sharing my faith and the Spirit of God is there working with me because it just flows. And then there's times like I'm butting my head up against the wall. <laughs> it is just not getting through, okay? I kind of felt and, like that just now. And, oh, every time. Every time in practice, it is much harder because God the Holy Spirit is not working on that other person to receive Christ. They've already received them, all right? And so you're, we're just we're just practicing, okay? We're just, all, when we do this, all we're doing is refining our, our, our skills. And, and uh, but... When I do, even when I did this, it's much harder than if I talk to somebody who totally doesn't, I don't know, who, who doesn't know Christ, and just share with them. Yeah. Because the Spirit of God will prompt me. And I will know at certain points, like this conversation is absolutely going nowhere. It's like the night that I was sharing my faith with the guy that was drunk. I'm sure the next morning he wouldn't have remembered a thing about what I, I, I told him, okay? And, and so uh, there, there are times when you just got to discern, this is going nowhere. And, uh, oh, I, I'm glad you shared your opinion. Maybe I could talk to you again sometime about your opinion and, and, and move on. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I don't force. I, man, if I don't sense that there's a flow going here, uh, you know, I'm not there to be argumentative. This is an opinion approach. Uh, it's not a confrontational in your face. If you want to learn that, I got another approach. <laughs> and then, and you then, might have to teach me that one. <laughs> <laughs> that takes several weeks to get it. You know, <laughs> I, I want to talk. Uh, wait, any there were questions? No, you you answered. Yeah, 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 you yeah, kind of had an answer because that was. Why is it so hard to convince the Jewish people or population about Jesus? Oh, in Deuteronomy it said that God was going to if they uh, He would give them a special blindness. And in Romans chapter 11, it says that he has blinded their eyes, okay? And so, uh, not that there are, aren't some who don't come to Christ, they do. There's a whole Messianic Jewish group, and they're Christians, and, uh, you know, they still uh, hold to all their Jewish traditions, plus uh, the Christian ones. Um, and, uh, they're, but they're a very small segment, because God always has a remnant according uh, to his grace. And, uh, you know, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century and he said you know if God had put marks on men's backs who were going to be saved I'd lift their shirt tail first <laughs> so that I know I'd preach to them but we preach to everybody and uh, and God will draw to, to him those that are his like Peter God revealed that to you God revealed that to you uh, and so 
But uh, I like where Paul says in First Timothy, I think it's First Timothy 1, 10, 2, 10, uh, it says, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the same salvation with eternal uh, glory. And so he said, I know that there's people out there to be reached. And when I share my message, God is going to work on some people's hearts. And they're going to respond. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so my job is just to be a faithful servant to preach and teach and share my faith. I cannot save anyone. The Holy Spirit uses the work of Christ, but He's chosen to use my message. Okay? And sometimes people come to know Christ when I share my faith. All right? Um, I'm going to share with you just for a moment. What if they object? Somebody objects, okay? Somebody says to you, well, well how about the heathen, you know, uh, in Africa who have never heard? Or... Uh, I don't believe the Bible. And, uh, and you want to just solve that? I don't know what that is. That's his fibulator. Yeah. What? Is, it? is anybody here a nurse? That's his fibulator. Well, they'll, they'll let us know if it's a problem. It might, it might be okay. a battery. He's got, he's maybe he's got a battery issue or something. All right. So if, if somebody objects with any of those, anything i don't believe the bible uh how, you can't prove that there's a god blah 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 anything they object to anything like that i got one real simple solution it's 99 of the time it handles it all you have to do is say well you know what i'm no expert on this are you an expert no no see i can't really say this but you can right i'm no expert on that but if i could find some information on it would you be willing to read it and if they say yes, then you come back to the pastor, you go to another expert, somebody, you go to Google and you look for, for some information on whatever it was. And if they're talking to you, well, I don't believe the, that the Bible is, it is, is the Word of God. Well, you just find the information that argues and makes the point for the Bible being the Word of God. And they say, hey, remember when I asked you that question? I found something really interesting to read. Boom. And you have them read it. Say, hey, when you're done reading, let's talk about it. It's so simple. <clears throat> Most people are afraid because you're going to say, what if? What if this happens or that happens? And I'm telling you right now, <clears throat> all you have to do is just say, well, I'm no expert on that, but <clears throat> if I found something you know, written on that, would you be willing to read it? And uh, I find most time they say yes. Go ahead. If they ask me usually questions like that, I say, well, what do you got to lose? <laughs> <laughs> good, good, right? That's a good response. But I like to get something in their hand because I want to carry on the conversation. And if I, if I get something in their hand, <clears throat> in fact, if you have a hard time, let me know and we'll find you something. Uh, years ago, I had a whole collection of audio cassettes. Nobody uses cassettes anymore. But they were on every possible objection you could think of. And I just, oh, here, give this to the person. Oh, give this to the person. You would listen to it, and it would have that. And, I, and uh, there's a bunch of sources we could go to where if a person is an objection, and it's a valid objection, Sometimes they're just smoke screen to get you to stop talking about it. But then when you get the material and give it to them, you've just blown their smoke screen. Oh, they got it. Oh, yeah. You got that for me. I'll read it. And then we're going to talk about it. And they say, hey, you know, I gave you that piece. Did you read about that? And, and then you can carry that on. Any other questions about that? Very simple. All right. Your assignment, if you should, if you're willing to accept it. <laughs> your assignment, your mission is to tell a millennial. The younger person, tell your grandkids or tell your great grandkids, tell, tell your neighbor kid, uh, find a millennial that you, <clears throat> tell them that you're taking a class at church on sharing your faith. And, 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 and you're going to do that by asking opinion questions. Say, hey, I'm taking this class at church, it's about how to share your faith, and I need to get some, somebody's opinion, and would you be willing to let me share my faith with you and, and get, ask you some opinion questions? Uh, <clears throat> I need somebody to practice that. And if they say okay, they give it a whirl. Give it a whirl. That's a, I think it's a very good approach. What's that? I think that's a very good approach to somebody where it might be a family member or something, yeah. and then you it, you don't know how to approach them, so therefore you ask them, can I practice on you, please? Yeah, I was yes, just said I had an assignment. <laughs> one of the gals that when I was pastoring in Ohio, one of the young ladies, she was a college student at Cedarville College, went back to the door and went to her roommate and said, Hey, um, I want to, I'm taking a class at church on how to share your faith. Would you be willing to let me share what I'm learning? She went through it, and at the end, where she got, Would you like to pray and accept Christ? And she said, 
oh, okay. And she said, all right, I'm done. And she said, no, no. I really mean it. And so she prayed and accept Christ as her Savior. Okay. Is that from a practice? From a practice. She must have been good at it. At a Christian college. <laughs> All right. like it's somebody that was already thinking. At, at, she had convinced everybody she was, but she knew deep down in her heart she really wasn't a Christian. She never really committed her heart to Jesus until that day. Is that amazing? At my first church, there was a guy. This is a great story. <clears throat> we, we went out. Uh, and so I would make appointments for them to because it's after vacation Bible school, follow up all the vacation Bible school needs. And, and a gentleman went to the wrong house. Knocked on the door, told my I'm from the White Hall Baptist Church, but we're here to share. And, uh, oh, uh, no, our kids didn't go to Bible school. I said, well, I said, I'd like to tell you about our church anyway. So I said, oh, come on in. He goes in, and, and he shares one verse. His approach was just John 3.16. He shared that one verse with the guy. He accepts his Christ as his Savior. Next week, his whole family is in church. Okay? And, uh, yeah, God did marvelous things for that man. All right. <clears throat> That's your assignment, okay? Now, I want to tell you, we got a little book here. I gave everybody a book. It's the Gospel of John, okay? I, came, I want to give everybody a Gospel of John so that you could even give this to a person that you share your faith with. You can just give it to them, okay? And then, I read the introduction. Whoever wrote this, man, he's on the same path as I am. I mean, he uses almost the exact same verses, same approach as what I put out, out, out here today. So I want you to read pages 5 to 10, and I'd like you to reread re -read this one sheet of paper where I got all the different columns, all the different responses, and just read these so that it just starts to become a part of you. It just flows. It becomes part of you. I guarantee you, if you were to read this stuff every day, you would read that introduction, you would read, read through that, taking a different column. By, by next week, you, this would be pretty much ingrained in your head where a real situation popped up. And the Holy Spirit would prompt the things that you've been reading, and you'd be able to respond to those. You'd be able to respond to those. Okay? Now, it says in Acts chapter 1, the next blank you got on your, your pages there is, You will be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1. You are a witness. You can be a good one, a bad one, but you are a witness. Every day our lives are speaking, okay? The question is, are our mouths speaking? Sometimes they're speaking things that shouldn't be spoken, but. I've just shared with you a celebrate your faith approach. I want to talk to you for a moment about come and see. Come and see is another approach to share. When I first came here as pastor, the first month I shared a sermon on come and see. Did anybody remember? Yeah. And then I passed out come and see cards. All right. So I got some come and see cards right here. So I'm going to throw a stack in the middle of every table. Yeah. You did? Okay. Come and see is the easiest approach to sharing your faith. Okay? Another one I'm going to talk about is prayer outreach. It's another very simple approach to sharing your faith. I feel that everybody should feel comfortable with some approach to sharing their faith. Alright? So let's talk about what is come and see. Come and see. This is an approach to give a Christian witness by inviting people to come and see what God is doing. Come and see. And so on our sheet here, the little card just simply says, I want to invite you to come and see what God is doing at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings at Bethany Church. And so it's just an invitation to come and see. Now, I see this in the Gospels. Jesus used this approach. The disciples said, hey, they weren't disciples yet, they're about to be, and they said, where are you staying? And he said, Come and see. Oh, they wound up being disciples, okay? Come, come and see. All right. Philip, uh, he uses this on, on, on Nathaniel. Nathaniel uh, says, Can anything good come from Nazareth? When he told him about Jesus, that he's a Nazarene, come from Nazareth. And he says, Come and see. Come and see. It's just an invitation. Come and see. Uh, the Samaritan woman, after she met Jesus and he exposed her sin, and, and she went, went back to, the, to Samaria. And, and uh, into Sychar, where she, she was outside the city, she went back and she told them, she said, there's a man I met at the well. He told me everything I ever did. The Greek text re renders it this way. He couldn't be the Messiah, could he? See, she knew she was a woman of bad reputation. So she doesn't act like she really knows something. She asks them a question. He couldn't be the Messiah, could he? And uh, 
She, and, and then they, he said, well, come. But she began that by saying, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Come and see. Come and see is, is the expression. Here's my favorite, the people of Bethany. <laughs> the people of Bethany. All right. And John 11, Lazarus uh, was, was dead. And uh, the people of Bethany uh, used this expression. They told him, Jesus, Lord, come and see where he lay. Okay, because they sealed up Lazarus in, in the tomb. It's the simplest approach. You just invite somebody to come. All right, come to church. You can do this. You can do this. You can find a person, a young person, somebody, and say, I want you to come and see what God is doing at our church. The last approach, and I'm running out of time, okay? The last approach I want to share is called uh, prayer outreach. And prayer outreach, this is a simple outreach uh, based on the Apostle Paul's prayer and desire. Romans 10.1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, I have to admit that Nona has encouraged me along the line of doing this prayer outreach. <laughs> okay, so uh, my text for it is here uh, in, in Romans chapter 10. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The participants in this outreach, they pray for lost people to come to Bethany to find the Lord. <coughs> and here's how this approach works. You choose a street. I don't care what street it is. You pick a street. Your neighborhood, one around here. I don't care. You pick, you pick a street. To pray over each home on each block of that street that you've picked. You can pick more than one street. It doesn't matter to me. Write down the street name and then list the address number for which you're praying. Be observant. If the home has a name on it or the mailbox, include that on your, your finding, okay? That you're going to pray for that, that house. Fill out the prayer outreach sheet. And I've given you a prayer outreach sheet, and I filled out one here on my screen so you kind of see it. This is my street. This, I made up these numbers except for the first one. That's my address. I don't know what they are my street. I didn't them up. All right. And so when I stop, and uh, I'm going to list, like, oh, I know whose name is this house because I live there, okay? And But then would be these houses. And, and I list them. And if I know, if I find something, because a lot of places has a name on it, okay? And uh, so you put that down, you jot that down, and then you start praying. Now I stop and I pray in front of the home. You pray as you collect this data. You say a simple prayer, just like the Apostle Paul prayed in Romans 10.1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, or for the Israelites, is that they might be saved. Only you do it like this. Oh, Lord, my heart's desire and prayer for the home at, and you read that address number is that they might come to faith in Jesus and to our church. That's, how, how simple can it get? That's all you do. Well, then what happens is you follow up on this. You bring your list back to church so that we can copy the addresses and do a Christmas and Easter mailing to them. And the card this year is going to look something like this. Why Christmas? All right, And that's going to be our Christmas sermon series. And we'll have one at Easter time. But we're going to make a special card for those who are using these, doing this. You're praying for these people? We're going to include in there a, a, a section that says, I've been praying for you that, you're, you know, that someone from your home would come and represent you for our service on Christmas Eve. Okay, And send this, we'll, we'll, we'll mail this out. We'll make them available. You can even sign it if you want so that it becomes personal. And they know that you pray for them. You're inviting them to come and see it's a real simple approach because you just go pray. Just pray. Them. I believe we can pray the bit. We can pray the bit. Uh, we had a couple of guests today that, you know, I think we've prayed the bit. We've been praying that people would come. So uh, you take your list home once you once you're done with the. You take your list home and you continue to pray for the home on the list until the next holiday when we do our actual mailing. Now, another thing that we can do, we got a prayer room here. If you're going to do this approach, I'd like to ask you to come early to church and go into the prayer room on a Sunday morning and pray for your addresses. Just pray for those residents. Say, Lord, here it is. You know, in, in the Old Testament, King uh, Hezekiah, uh, he got a threatening letter from Sennacherib's army. And when he got it, he took it into the temple, he laid it out, 
and he prayed. And God sent Isaiah the prophet to say, not one arrow is going to come over the wall. There's, there's 50,000 warriors surrounding the city. Not one arrow is even going to come across over the wall. And it said the next morning when they went out, they found them all dead. Some translations, they found them themselves dead. I don't know how you find yourself dead, but they're, they're, they had all died. The Lord had fought the battle. He went in, he took the, the scroll before the Lord. And that's kind of the theme here. We're going to pray for these homes, and then we're going to follow up with an invitation to these homes, but we're going to have them praying for these homes that God will bring people in. Does that make sense? It's an outreach. It's an outreach. Prayer outreach. All right. Now, it's time for a commitment on your part. I got a commitment sheet. It's in your book. And it's got, uh, I'm committed, yes, to come and see. Yes, I'm committed. This is my style of sharing my faith. You can count on me to prayerfully ask someone to come to church, especially for Christmas slash Easter. Uh, celebrate your faith. Yes, I'm concerned for the younger generation and will stretch myself to share the celebrate your faith approach with a millennial or Gen Xer or someone else, anybody, and I will let you know how it goes. And then the third one is, yes, I believe God will hear and answer my prayers to build His church, so I will prayerfully choose a neighborhood, and I will pray for each house, collecting the info for a future invitation mailing. Okay, count on me to do all three. <laughs> all right? And uh, signing your name is optional, but I'd like to get them all back, because next Sunday night, at our concert of prayer, we're going to start praying that God will use our outreach. God will start using our outreach. We'll be praying for people to come in, praying for those who really want to share their faith effectively one-on-one. -on -one. We'll be just sharing sharing our faith and praying that God will, will bless so that we, we, we can see what will happen here. I've told the, the, the deacons this when I was pastoring in Muskegon. I had a, a group of men and we got together every Tuesday afternoon about 5 o'clock. They got off work sometimes earlier than that. And there was a handful of us, six to eight guys. And we would pray through every request that's on in the church, kind of like our deacons do here. We do this every other week. We go through every single request we can find in the church and we pray for them. And the guys started praying that God would just bring people to the church. So we're meeting this one night. And there's a banging on the door, and a guy says, uh, man, I need to go into, into the sanctuary and pray. So he came into the sanctuary and prayed. And one of the, one of the other gentlemen went in, because I was leading the prayer group at that time, went in and, and prayed with this guy. And pretty soon he's coming to church. And uh, he had gotten himself in some trouble with a DUI. He was about to lose his job, and he needed prayer for his job. And so where did he go, man? He went to the church. We are praying as one guy. He, he visited his, his um, mother. She was at a nursing home just down the street from the church. And we've been praying that God would just bring some men in, bring some men in, and the guys were doing this. And uh, one, one Sunday after he was visiting his mom, he pulled, he said, the traffic was so heavy, I decided I'd just pull out the other way. And he said, pull out the other way, I was going to do my turnaround in your parking lot. He said, well, there's an empty space. I'll just pull it and go to church. So he pulled in and came to church. He came next for the next two years before he moved to Florida. He came simply because those guys were praying and God brought them out. I, I think these are three very effective means. Come and see, celebrate your faith, and prayer outreach. We combine these three, I think God will be very well pleased. And he will cause our church to grow. The whole thing is cyclical. You make the great confession, all right? And you confess that Jesus is the Christ. You begin to do the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. So you're worshiping Him. You're loving your neighbor as yourself. You're reaching out to Him. And the great commission. I'm telling this neighbor about Jesus. This neighbor accepts Jesus as his Savior. Makes the great confession. Does the great commandment. Does the great commission. And around and around and around it goes. And the church grows. The church grows. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. These are his three great things that he left us. The great confession, the great commandment, the great commission. So before you leave, turn in your sheets. I'll, I'll close in prayer. We've done just a few minutes early. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we've been able to do this series. We pray, Father, that you will bless as we all make an endeavor, Lord, 
to reach out to someone who needs Jesus. That they might come to Bethany, uh, Lord, uh, either here to find Jesus, or we might take the message to them and then they come back here. They get saved and baptized, join the church, just like in the book of Acts. We pray for that, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. We're going to have